Guys and gals, just a quick reminder before you watch this video, do not forget to subscribe for more content such as this. And if you do so, please click the little bell symbol right next to the subscribe button. You'll get notifications on your phone, on your tablet, and on your laptop for when you can get more content from this beautiful face once more. It has been long overdue, but finally I am ready to break down the original 1994 Spider-Man the Animated Series. Yes, I had to take the costume off. <laughs> These lights eventually get hot, so I had to take it off. It's just going to get really itchy, sweaty, and gross. I really wanted to be comfortable during this review, but hey, I'm still representing. You guys know that I'm a huge Spider-Man fan. I got my shirt. I got I forgot to clean it up, but I got my cup here, my sippy cup that I usually drink out of every day. Goddamn Spider-Man. All right, I just sprinkled water everywhere. The last remaining water that there was in there. I hope that nothing here is going to have an electrical fuse despite all of the electronics that are sipped around, but I'm willing to take that risk for for the fans, you know, for the for the people. And on top of that, I'm actually honoring the poll that I made a few weeks closing in on a month or so ago about what you guys decided on. You've spoken, I've listened. I am going to be breaking down all five seasons of Spider-Man the Animated Series video by video. So this first video is actually going to encompass all of season one. Well, I want to say all of season one, but I'm going to run through season one as quickly as possible. So expect the video to hopefully be on the shorter side and also to not have any proper formal ratings at the end. I'm not going to rate the show based on just one season, knowing that there's an entire four other seasons to check out long after this video. So this one's just going to have to do with season one. It's freshman uh, take on Spider-Man the Animated Series as it was back in 1994 across 13 episodes. And if you're a 90s baby just like I am, you know that the 1990s were ripe for Saturday morning cartoons from every character possible out of the DC pantheon, the Marvel comic characters, even some Disney characters that they just were original at the time or were stripped from other properties but then given that really uh, pulpy feeling of the Saturday morning cartoon aesthetic that really worked like DuckTales, Tailspin, uh, um, Gargoyles for God's sakes and Spider-Man just happened to fall into that pool of so many others that just made Saturday mornings oh so great to wake up to as a kid even if that morning is a little too early for me at this point where we're talking like 9 or 8 o'clock in the morning but back then it was worth it and now, looking back at the show, it really brings back some really classic nostalgic memories. But exactly how does Spider-Man the Animated Series, out of all of them, manage to live up after all these years? And by years, I mean literally talking 20, almost 25 years since that shit came out. Yeah, that's how old you are. Before I break it down, a little backstory behind the show. Not a whole lot to it except that in the 1990s, Steve Ditko and Stan Lee themselves actually overlooked the process of bringing Spider-Man an animated series, or at least a brand new animated series, to the fold of the 1990s with the development of brand new animation technology. In fact, so much so that they actually wanted to use as much CGI as they possibly could. If you couldn't already tell from some of the little uh, snippets that you've seen from the show already, However, budget constraints really played a part on the show w with its 20 or 22 or even 18 minutes at times minute format per episode. And it spanned also across five seasons, making it the second longest animated show from the 1990s based on a Marvel character. First, uh, the honor of the first being going to X-Men. That's actually rather peculiar, but it kind of makes sense considering how much X-Men is actually willing to explore. And who knows, maybe in the future, I might tackle that in a separate review. But for the time being, it all started in 1994 with Season 1, and that starts now. In case you were living under a rock, the story of Spider-Man obviously tells the story of Peter Parker, a mild-mannered... Oh, jeez, this... Okay, uh... That was... That was out of nowhere. Well, again, Peter Parker, he's just your average kid. You know, he lives in New York and Queens with his aunt. And, oh, shit. Oh, okay. All right. Car chase. I don't, mm, all right, that was some hefty <laughs> whiplash from uh, from that opener. All right, well, I guess you know, uh, um, 
fuck it. So as you can tell, Spider-Man the Animated Series in 1994 skipped the entirety of the origin for Spider-Man. Something that wasn't necessarily pioneered by the show. I mean, we've had other interpretations of Spider-Man, both in animated and even live action form at the time, 1970s. Spider-Man, wow, that's embarrassing to watch. But it wasn't necessarily unheard of for a Spider-Man show to really start off from like the middle of his of his uh, uh, of his really refined years of being Spider-Man and it's kind of refreshing to kind of go back and watch Spider-Man after all of these reboots and reinterpretations of the character that have gone over the origin story to a fault that knowing that the original 1994 Spider-Man actually took a, a really wise page from some other versions of the character where it's just like screw it let's just jump into his everyday life and then maybe as it progresses we'll kind of explore a little bit of the origin or at least touch base on some of the uh, finer details as to what makes him Spider-Man based on that origin with Uncle Ben and the situation that he found himself in his big mistake that caused him to have great responsibility with the great powers yes I fucked the line up on purpose because we've all heard it time and time before and that was cool for that reason because it was cool to unfold the history of Spider-Man as I progressed through this first season while at the same time also having a very comic book style approach to the way that season one tells stories of Spider-Man because it doesn't tell one singular story and this is kind of, I guess you can kind of say that maybe this is what was influenced by the uh, by the involvement of Stan Lee and Steve Ditko is that season one of Spider-Man 1994 really plays out like a comic book where you got multi multiple plots multiple story arcs that begin course through and then end and then right when the end a brand new one starts and because of that you have multiple episodes that have those bumpers where it's like previously on spider-man next time on spider-man even if the episode didn't particularly end with a cliffhanger they still did that because they all it was all having a metaphorical web string together it, with the Spider-Man mythos behind it, very comic book style, and it was something about that that really gave the show its charm and really gave uh, me that, that incentive to want to progress through the 13 episodes. On top of that, it was also that aesthetic that made it charming, and along with the characters that were surprisingly charming, despite how very Saturday morning cartoon the show still feels all these years later 25 years later and yes the show still has that very Saturday morning cartoon feel based on its frenetic pacing the way it just kind of quickly transitions from one shot to the next and then you also have you know that bombastic um, music and the way the characters also tell their lines Shaka! Chase you to the ends of the earth! And because it's still a Saturday morning cartoon starring a character that's wearing a very vibrant red and blue costume, you're going to be attracting children, especially on the weekends that they're off from school. So they couldn't take certain extents with the character, especially during the 90s where everything's not so censored as it was right now, but they kind of wanted to touch base with that line. And it was during the 90s where you had so many shows that were categorically kid shows, but they still had moments where you're like, oh, this is a little adult, not because it's inappropriate, but it's just because it's a joke that an adult would get. And Spider-Man, much like with its peers like uh, Gargoyles, as I mentioned, or Batman the Animated Series, would have their f fair share of moments where they would have references or jokes to things that only adults would understand. So, uh, when does this place apply for statehood? Now I've stepped into a Ray Harryhausen movie. Maybe it's more like Roger Corman. But it's almost like for every moment where that happened, there also had to be another moment where they had to cater to the kids, whether it be a joke that fits for the kids and not so much for the adults, or the very glorious amount of, uh, of overexposure or exposition so that kids can understand what exactly is happening in the plot, where ever so often, Spider-Man just has to say every single little thing that's on his mind, whether it's him trying to tackle his relationships with the women in his life, or his social problems, or of course, how to thwart the big bad guy of the week. You're scared. This lizard creature is powerful enough to tear you limb from limb. But you can't even hurt him, because trapped inside is your friend. But I have to fight him. It's the only way to stop him, to save him. But I look past it. I look past it, rewatching all these episodes again decades later, because even after all this time, 
Christopher Daniel Barnes, who portrays our very own friendly neighborhood Spider-Man in this 94 Spider-Man, is still charming as hell. Despite all of his exposition, and at times his overacting, especially when the uh, black suit takes over, he's, there's still something about that voice that's just very seminal to this version of the character. And there's also multiple instances of very surprised voice towns behind the show that are still very timeless. Ed Asner. Ed Asner is J. Jonah Jameson. And this is still the voice that I think of when I think of a very gruffled and very uh, a, a very snookerpuss type of J. Jonah Jameson as Peter continuously calls him as Spider-Man. And then, of course, the girl next door, Mary Jane Watson, and the voice actress behind her. She's also superb still after all these years. You even got Jennifer Hale is in there, I think, as Felicia Hardy. If you guys don't know who Jennifer Hale is, you probably already heard her voice on a number of video games, particularly uh, Mass Effect as the female Shepard, who does, I think, uh, everybody agrees, does a way uh, I'm sorry, dude, but way better job than the male version of Shepard. And so many other also surprise guests and cameos from the voice talents that really work for this aesthetic of the, of the character, despite of how cheesy and over the top it may seem at times there's just also something so pulpy and just so vibrant about the version of these characters the way that they're portrayed the way that their stories are told despite being in slight 20 minute chunks that just works from episode to episode especially when ever so often they sprinkle some brand new takes on these characters that you weren't really expecting uh, to really be in a season one freshman take on the character even before it was really proven to be renewed for a second season or even a third season going in with the hobglob Hobgoblin before the Green Goblin. That's a very bold take. And also so many other twists and different versions of characters' origins. One very surprising and rather dark one on J. Jonah Jameson and a certain tragedy that happened in his past. And then even a really excellent, well-paced take on the Eddie Brock slash Venom slash Symbiote storyline that's really set up very well. It's almost like in the back burner, this was actually the main plot of Season 1. It's just that it was almost like a case of misdirection or a magic trick. They made you think that you were getting all these short bits with the lizard and shocker and rhino and all these things. While in the background, you just had Eddie Brock just kind of looming in the background. And building up on his character led to a very surprising climax and really awesome three-part story arc of the symbiote suit. That, in my opinion, is one of the best versions of that whole story arc besides what we got in the comics. No, not that. And I mentioned earlier about budget constraints and how that kind of had some influence on the way that the episode had that frenetic pacing for a 90s show with only being 20 minutes per episode. And also that led into its usage of CGI. One of the things that everybody remembers about this version of Spider-Man was how ever so often Spider-Man would swing through the city and they would use those CG backgrounds that he would swing through or even if he wasn't swinging like some helicopter would be zooming through the cityscape and every building was that really playstation one looking graphic and it's funny because initially they wanted to do that for every single time that spidey swung but as you can tell and as if you have watched the show you know that that wasn't the case you only got like a couple of shots per episode before they eventually switched over to traditional to the animation that's exactly where the budget came in to kind of snip them at the knees a little bit that and also it's almost like they only scored about 10 maybe 15 minutes worth of actual music and then they just kind of looped it because how many times throughout the 13 episodes i watched it i hear the same motif it's, it's the same thing. Mark my words. Good thing I reloaded my webbing. But you know what? They persevered because even with the CG kind of strapped out and ever so often them having to resort to a copy and paste style to some shots of animation... The actual animation in those shots is actually pretty fucking good for a 90s show. The way that our characters are designed from Spider-Man himself, even though he doesn't have the lean physique that you're usually accustomed to seeing Spider-Man in recent years, he has the more built-up physical uh, physique. 
So much so that it's really hard to buy the Peter Parker version of Peter as a dork because the dude looks kind of jacked and it looks like he could punch a hole through somebody, <laughs> even with making him wear that polo shirt. God damn it. But the design of the characters from Peter to Mary Jane, J. Jonah Jameson, the villains themselves, including uh, Venom, who looks uh, spectacular, the Hobgoblin, and then just the quality of the actual animation from the shadows to the line work to the shading, all that good stuff. I mean, I'm not exactly an artist myself. Myself. I don't really draw that much. I'm kind of a terrible drawer. Uh, and that's me being modest. But it, I can really, really take note and really appreciate the amount of level of detail and work they managed to put into every single page of animation they made for the 20 minutes of each episode. It's remarkable to see that this thing went on for like five seasons during the 90s when making an animated show was super expensive. So to, so to see the quality of the designs of these characters, Dr. Octopus, all the villains, and then of course all of our main heroes, Spider-Man, uh, some of surprise characters that popped up here and there, they really, really took care of their animation. They knew that their animation was what they needed to really stand out. It wasn't a simple copy and paste type thing we got going on today with that same style that we see all over fucking Cartoon Network. No, it was not that. This was actually a very renaissance type of moment in the 90s where animation was key and i'm glad to see that not only were the actual designs of the characters really uh, done really really well and spectacular but it's also the animation the animations despite uh, cutting a little too early here and there to again limit the budget and make sure that they don't go over budget per 20 minute episode there's certain motions that just look so good. Every time Spider-Man does something kind of a, uh, athletic with his abilities and he's web swinging around and he shoots out a web or he's fighting an enemy during an action sequence or that enemy does something to ha kind of have the upper hand over Spider-Man, it looks great. It looks great despite having a little, a few too many quick cuts. When they do happen, they actually look spectacular and they still stand the test of time. And it was this animation, the charming level of quality with the characters and their voice talent, despite flaws found in almost every part uh, of the show that were mainly a, a, a part of its time. It, it, you, you know, it wasn't like something that I, I can't say, oh, that's an issue right right there, regardless of what type of show. It's it's a, it's almost like a time capsule. As I progressed through these first 13 episodes within the first season, it, I was like, this is generally a time capsule that is not going to be able to be replicated in the world of animation today. Because one Kids these days just have a brand new mentality when it comes to cartoons that is not going to be looked at the same way we looked at Spider-Man in 1994. And because of that, the, the even the flaws that I kind of complained about in this video here, whether it be some of the overacting in the voice or maybe even some things not making kind of sort of sense in the story or like certain situations where you have to suspend your disbelief because it's a Saturday morning cartoon... Even those flaws have a level of charm to them taken out of the 90s that is just not going to be replicated. It's lightning in a bottle, and I don't think that we're going to see something like that again, at least in contemporary times, as long as we don't have more uh, people who worked on this show that would then proceed to work. In fact, I'm pretty certain that people who worked on this show worked on Spectacular Spider-Man. And that's why Spectacular Spider-Man is as great as it is. Because they learned from the pred pedigree of the 90s shows such as Spider-Man, Batman the Animated Series, uh, 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 Gar uh, Gargoyles, even X-Men. Even though I wasn't a huge X-Men cartoon fan from the 90s, I still recognize what kind of ecosphere they were having there and spider-man is just one leg of that where it wasn't so much it was all about the quality and not so much quantity it's a tv show it's a cartoon saturday morning show that was actually only 13 episodes that they decided to take something that could have easily harmed them which were the budget constraints and decided to switch it and turn it on, to, on its head by making a charming show with a charming protagonist that not only is a very likable protagonist that has you caring for the uh, the situations he finds himself in despite being over the top or cartoonish at times but still win you over with his likability, his relatability, and also how faithful he is to the original character for Spider-Man purists. 
because despite all, all that and despite some different al uh, alternate alternations they made to certain characters origins and stuff like that it still felt like I was watching a comic book in motion and that's precisely what a spider-man animated show is supposed to do again I will not be giving individual ratings for the seasons this is the stance that I'm kind of taking on maybe I'll rate the show as a whole when I get around to the ending of season 5 but as it stands right now I'm definitely looking forward to jumping into season 2 that concludes part one of my multi-part, deep, analytical look at Spider-Man the Animated 90s TV show. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please make sure in the comments let me know where you guys' favorite moments and favorite memories from watching the original 1994 Spider-Man animated series. I'm really looking forward to hearing what you guys have to say. Also make sure to show your support for this video by hitting the like button, hitting the share button so that other people know that the video is up. Because I'm pretty sure that some of you guys were looking forward to hearing what my thoughts are on the Spider-Man 90s show. At least for the first season. Look forward to the second season review coming hopefully in the next few weeks or so. I don't really want to give quote you guys an exact time, but uh, rest assured that I'll be jumping on that right away. And if you guys want to catch when it goes up, make sure to hit the subscribe button and also hit the little notification bell right next to it. That way, as soon as it goes up, your phone's going to light up, your, your laptop's going to give you a little blip, and you'll know exactly when to watch it. Other than that, make sure to follow me on Twitter and on Instagram at DarkSpiderDavid and also twitch.tv slash DarkSpiderDavid. I am streaming games over there now. I'm jumping from game to game and I stream like every other day, every second day, every third day or so. But uh, I really want to get a following going. Uh, trying to hit a goal of 50 followers at the moment. I think I'm up close to about halfway there. I'm not entirely sure. But trying to hit 50 followers and after that 100 followers and then after that the moon. Until next time, guys. Catch you later. I guess this is really how the suit kind of looks here on camera. I'm actually rather surprised that my arm, my scissor uh, boom stand for my mic was able to extend this far up. So hopefully I'm coming across fairly clearly into the mic. But this is the Zentai uh, 7 Plus lycra unisexual suit in action on my body and it feels really hot and really sweaty